Let us pray for inspiration. Holy Spirit, you fill our hearts. Kindle in them the fire of your love and fill our minds with the light of your wisdom. Amen. <clears throat> our church doesn't take everything in the Bible literally, but that doesn't mean we don't take some things in the Bible literally. For example, the things that Jesus taught, like, do not judge, love your neighbor as yourself, forgive your enemy. Ooh, that's difficult, but we take those things very literally. And we take literally the facts about Jesus' life. Jesus taught and he healed and he experienced this incredible oneness with God and he transformed lives because of that incredible oneness with God. And we also take literally the historical circumstances in Jesus' life, the historical context. He was executed by the Roman authorities for challenging their oppressive values. Crucifixion was a form of punishment reserved for political insurgents. We take the historical context of Scripture literally and very, very seriously because they reveal to us the significance of courageous actions like those of Jesus. And when we know the historical contexts of Scripture passages, then we can compare those contexts to our own context to figure out how they're related. What do these passages mean for us, for our life today? For example, without knowing the historical context of today's passage of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it doesn't make a lot of sense. What does Paul mean when he says... Finish what you started last year. What did the Corinthians start that they need to finish? What does Paul mean when he says, your surplus matches their deficit? What surplus? Whose deficit? And who in the world are the Corinthians anyway? And why are we reading this letter? What do they have to do with us? Well, Unless we know the literal context of this passage, we, we really can't know what it means to the Corinthians or what it means for our lives. So let's look at the, the context. The Corinthians were the members of a church founded by Paul in the city of, you guessed it, Corinth, <laughs> present-day Greece. And Corinth was this amazing, cosmopolitan, prosperous city in the Roman Empire. And in the Corinthian church, there were many, many prosperous members whom Paul had to remind not to look down their noses at the poor members of the church. And he had to remind them to share their food with the poorer members in their church potlucks. Imagine that, hogging your food. <laughs> now, P Paul did all of this reminding through letters because once he founded the church in Corinth, he left it in the hands of church leaders to go and found other churches. And in his letters to the Corinthians, we have two of them, Paul actually addressed several conflicts. This was a, a church often in conflict. Today, I want to focus on his concern in this passage, the passage that we have before us from the letter of Corinthians. Evidently, the year before, the Corinthian church had made a financial pledge to help the very, very poor, struggling church in Jerusalem. And now, evidently, they were hesitating in making good on that pledge. So Paul in today's passage, is reminding them of their promise, and he's telling the Corinthians 
that their financial assistance isn't a handout to slackers. It is a form of care, a real assistance to a church that is very, very poor. And so the Corinthians will be giving from their surplus to a church that's in deficit. Well, that's the literal message, the little, literal context of this passage. Those are the facts, the literal facts. But if we want to understand the deeper message for the Corinthians and for us, then we have to go beyond just the literal level of this passage. And actually, that's what Paul himself does in the letter. He says that the reason the Corinthians should share their financial resources is because of the example of the Lord Jesus, who made himself poor so that they would be rich. Now, Paul doesn't mean that literally. Jesus made himself poor so that the Corinthians would be rich. It's true, Jesus didn't have a lot of possessions. And in the Gospels, Jesus says that he had no place, permanent place to lay his head. True, that's true. But Paul doesn't mean that Jesus became impoverished, destitute, giving up everything so that the Corinthians could be financially well off. And Paul doesn't literally mean that the Corinthians are supposed to become impoverished and give up everything. He says, give what you can, not what you can't. So when Paul says that Jesus became poor, as I was telling our young people, he didn't mean, doesn't mean that he was giving away all of his possessions. It's much more profound than that, that Jesus gave his very self away in everything that he did, in everything that he said. He didn't cling to his ego. He didn't cling to security. He didn't cling to his possessions. He shared lavishly out of love, even finally giving his very life out of love. He was crucified for confronting the Roman authorities, on behalf of people who were poor and people who were oppressed, on behalf of a way of life that's shaped by compassion and forgiveness and generosity and service and justice, a way of life very different from the way of life than those Roman authorities, a way of life very different from the world of the Roman Empire, very threatening to authorities when you start preaching on street corners, this different way of life, but Jesus gave his life for that. So when Paul urges the Corinthians to be generous as Jesus was generous, he means that they, that we, should be generous out of gratitude for Jesus' self-giving we should follow in the way of Jesus in self-giving, giving of ourselves. And all that we are, all that we have, including our finances, of course, it's just one more thing that we have that we share. So Paul is saying that as followers of Jesus, that we should ask the question, what would Jesus do? We all know that, that famous question. That question is actually part of the title of a book bestseller written in 1898 by one of our own, a congregational minister named Charles Sheldon. He founded a church in Topeka, Kansas, my hometown, Central Congregational Church. There's a Charles Sheldon Museum there with a lot of his things. I interned in that church one whole summer, so I, I feel close to the spirit of Charles Sheldon in that question, what would Jesus do? Well, in Sheldon's novel, the main character is Reverend Henry Maxwell. And one Friday morning, Reverend Maxwell is preparing his sermon, and a poor man comes to his door and asks for financial assistance. And he's all wrapped up in his sermon. He's got things to do. And patiently, he just dismisses this man. And then this poor man shows up in his church on Sunday morning. And at the end of the sermon, he marches up the aisle 
stands in front of the congregation and the minister and confronts them for their lack of compassion for jobless men like him. And then he collapses and he dies a few days later. Very dramatic. No wonder it was a best-selling novel. <laughs> so this dramatic event changes Reverend Maxwell's heart. The next Sunday, he himself confronts the congregation, confronts himself, challenges them, challenges himself in all that they do to ask the question, what would Jesus do? And the rest of the novel is spent showing what Jesus would do with particular kinds of decisions. This question, what would Jesus do, moves us beyond the literal facts about Jesus' life, his literal circumstances. He wore a robe, maybe, sandals, lived in Galilee. These are things that he literally did that we're not being asked to do right. Moves us beyond the literal level and moves us even beyond the literal level of scripture texts, of all scripture texts, to ask of each text what its essential meaning is, what its essential meaning is when it comes to the life and the words, the message of Jesus. What is the meaning for a community of faith like ours? Because the individual facts, the specific facts and passages may have no resemblance to the facts in our lives. So, for example, our circumstances here at College Avenue are very different from the circumstances of the church at Corinth. We don't have many, many prosperous members that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, they did. They had many, many wealthy members. We're not being asked to give money to an impoverished church in Jerusalem. The facts are different. Instead, our financial giving helps those who are poor by maintaining our buildings where we house homeless families in the Family Promise Program and where we feed the spiritually hungry in worship and in fellowship and in outreach, etc. But like the Corinthian church, we are asked to give what we can financially out of, out of gratitude for the self-giving life of Jesus, whose life transforms our own life. His life transforms our own life, if we let it. And whose spirit fills us with hope and courage and generosity and passion for God's dream in the world and living out that dream in the world. That's a great gift to receive. And in every kind of giving in our church, every kind of giving, financial giving, serving, listening to one another, supporting one another, welcoming the stranger who comes among us, paying careful attention to the most vulnerable, in all these kinds of giving, we have to start out by asking that question, what would Jesus do? And then respond with his generosity of heart. That's how you become poor, giving your heart away, right? So we can become poor the way that Jesus became poor so that we become rich the way Jesus became rich. Rich in life, abundant, abundant life, meaning, connection to one another, purpose in our world. We're called to do so much and to be so much in our world. That's the good news. That's what it means to be rich. And if that kind of wealth sounds good to you, please say amen. If you are familiar with this next song, The Gift That You Gave Me, please feel free to sing along. <laughs> 